So have you, have you had your uh, 6 a.m. workout today? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's uh, 1230 our time here. So, yeah, no, we trained uh, yeah 7 a.m. So wow. we actually moved it back a little bit. Wow. I, I'm an artist, so I can work out like 7 p.m. <laughs> and wake up maybe at 10. <laughs> Am I allowed to? <laughs> uh, do, do you have kids? <laughs> no, no, not yet. <laughs> yeah, see, that's the big difference. You got to have kids. That's uh, always the harder one. So uh, <laughs> my family, we were planning, this is pre-COVID, of course, we were planning to go to Rome this year uh, as like, uh, you know, take the whole family. And I, uh, I took a bunch of classes in college on like Rome and like the forum and like the, you know, that whole deal. So uh, I had been talking about this for years and we planned this big trip to like, for like three weeks, we were going to go to Italy. We were going to go to Rome. We were going to go to Venice and all of a sudden COVID hit and we were like, Oh, so yeah, it was, uh, yeah, sucks. I don't know if you've ever been to, to Rome, but it's, it's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. So, I, well, it, it was a loss indeed. And uh, on my behalf, I was going to California. I was going to actually uh, get to know the United States for the first time. So now I guess it's, it's a, little, a little bit um, off, off, off for this year at least. Uh, what do you think of all this? I, I, I know I, I saw you in an interview saying something like, I'm glad you did not talk about the COVID. I don't mean the COVID. I mean the polarization of every ideals, every, you know, the burning down or the taking down of statues and all this racial uh, inequality stuff and the, the, the police versus Black Lives Matter. What do you think of it all? Oh, man, uh, there's a lot to unpack. Um, man. OK, where do I start? Uh, like, I really don't believe in coincidence. Uh, I've always kind of felt that, you know, things happen for a reason. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of coincidence. It just seems really interesting that all of a sudden this, uh, you know, kind of Black Lives Matter and this whole movement really started in the wake of the COVID deal. Um, it just feels like very, very just interesting timing. Not to say that those, you know, George Floyd and that whole deal was, was uh, you know, orchestrated, but uh, it was definitely a lot of people were at home. People were bummed and, uh, you know, all the other political issues that you're seeing just created a really interesting environment here in the United States. Um People are pissed, man. People are angry, but I'm, I'm kind of with you. Uh, I've never been a big fan of ripping down monuments. So uh, I've always believed that, you know, our history is our history, whether it's good, you know, and everybody's history is really bad. I mean, if you look at like the, you know, look at Spain, look at Portugal, look at how, uh, you know, the Spanish conquest of like the, you know, of, of, uh, of Mexico and, and Latin America is pretty ugly stuff. I mean, um, people have done a lot of bad things to each other over the years. And the only way that we hope to avoid them is by remembering these things and not whitewashing them. And I feel so much like, I don't know if, if any of your listeners have ever read the book Animal Farm, uh, but, you know, uh, Brave New World or George Orwell, uh, what things people tend to do is they tend to rip down monuments and rewrite history. And I think when we get to the point where we forget our history, we're doomed to repeat it. Okay, so when I went to college, um, my dad was an attorney, my brother's an attorney, uh, you know, lawyer. So law has kind of been our family business mm -hmm. for as long as I can remember. So when I went to college, uh, I had visions of being an attorney and I was going to go to law school. So the first day I showed up, uh, you know, I went to go play football, obviously at UC Berkeley. And the guy that I, they hooked me up with, who was my, like, I don't know, um, academic advisor on my recruiting trip was this old guy, a guy named Adrian Cragen. And he had been a former dean of the law school, Bolt Hall, which was at Berkeley, which is one of the most prestigious in all the United States. Um, as I sat down with him, it turned out that the old lawyer who apprenticed my father and him were friends. And uh, so we sat there and, you know, I got to talk to this really amazing dude who was, you know, had been an attorney from like, you know, like since the 50s. And uh, when I asked him, how should I approach my academic career here at Berkeley? And he said, you need to learn to read and write to the best of your ability. So there's a major here called rhetoric. I want you to check it out. So uh, when I went in for my, you know, I ended up attending Berkeley my very first semester, we had to take some English classes and they had like English one, English two. And then there was uh, these other classes, which was rhetoric 1A uh, and rhetoric 1B, I want to say. So I signed up for the rhetoric classes on his recommendation. And it was 
one of the best classes I've ever taken. I mean, it was like, hey, the professor showed up and said, hey, here are these, you know, 10 books I want you to read. Um, this is the first one we're going to read. I want you to be able to be prepared to discuss it. And we're going to pull different arguments out of these books. And I want you to be able to debate them and understand and write papers based upon this stuff. So I went home and just read all the books, uh, you know, read the first book, came in, you know, sat in kind of a Socratic method round table. We discussed all the, all the books, all the arguments, everything that we were trying to pull out of it. And uh, I ended up doing really well. And uh, I realized that this rhetoric thing was for me. I got to read and I got to write and I got to argue and I got to learn the fundamentals of argument. You know, and if you look back at like, you know, the first rhetorician was Cicero, you know, as we were, we were talking about Rome earlier, who was a Roman, um, you know, ethos, pathos and logos and how to formulate arguments and how to break them down. And, um, you know, ability to argue this side, but also to have the empathy to understand where the other person is coming from so that you can argue in defense of whatever you're attacking. So it just provided me a lot of life skills um, and prepared me to go to law school. So I ended up graduating in four years and then I was still had another year of football. So I ended up getting a master's or working on my master's in education. And I was planning to go to law school and then I got drafted to go play in the NFL. And I figured like, oh, I'll play in the NFL for a little bit. I don't necessarily <laughs> know how long I'll play because like the average career spans about three years. And uh, there, you know, not that many white dudes do it. And um, I figure I'd play a couple of years, make a little bit of money, and then go back to law school. And that turned into 10 years. 10 years. So, yeah, so then when I retired from the NFL, uh, I was sitting on the couch and I like was filling out law school applications. I had to retake my LSAT, which is the entrance exam. And uh, about that time was when you know my phone rang and it was uh, CEO of, uh, then CEO of CrossFit, Greg Glassman, asking me if I would be interested in creating my own version of CrossFit you know, based on power, strength, and speed for, for field sport athletes. And I remember talking to my brother, who's an attorney, and he was like, well, you know, you can go to law school, uh, but, you know, you, who knows? Maybe this CrossFit thing might be something fun that you do for a year or two and then go to law school. And I was like, okay. So we ended up doing CrossFit football, and now here we are 10 years later after that. So it comes to show that opportunity does come. You just got to be ready. So I guess uh, – uh, going back backwards a little bit, I guess communication is one of the most important tools either for a coach, even a football player. And uh, uh, now as a fitness, do you already consider yourself a fitness entrepreneur? Do you like the word? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I mean, we, we had to talk about this today. Uh, Luke and Tex, who, who I work with, were joking that they called me a but they call me an A-list fitness celebrity. And I was like, uh, I was like, I don't know how to take that one. So, uh, but like, I wouldn't put myself in the, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I just happened to be a dude that played in the NFL who uh, had a pretty interesting idea. So I think a lot of people that get the chance to go play in the NFL are just so naturally gifted from day one that they don't necessarily understand the path that it took to get them there. They were just better than everybody. They grew bigger and stronger. They didn't get injured and they just were able to do it. It kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, I don't know. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Goodwill Hunting when she asked him, oh, like, yeah. how, how can you, you know, how can you do my calculus homework? And he's like, well, you remember he talked about Mozart and Beethoven sitting down playing the piano and he's I like, can I can't play, play the piano, but I can just play. But you can do my Oakham paper in under an hour. Right. Well, I mean, when it came to stuff like that, I could always just play. So I think most professional athletes, they can just play. For me, um, I was always trying to fool somebody into thinking I was better than I was. So I had a, you know, uh, a very real, I guess you could say pathway to greatness where um, that involved training uh, a lot of like uh, effort and persistence and understanding the fine points of this thing. And I took a very analytical approach and determining like to not only in the preparation physically, but how I played the game and the way that I, you know, intellectually saw the game and I understood it. So uh, I had a really interesting skill set that I developed coming from like a martial arts fighting background, um, you know, and then being fairly analytical and understanding it. And just it just I, I was able to build myself into a very accomplished player. Um, and my goal was I always wanted to fool people into thinking that they were that I was better than that uh, than I really was. And so when I got out of the NFL and they asked me, like, how did you do these things? I had a pretty interesting blueprint for athleticism. And the way that I understood movement and, you know, this and like reduction of force and like, you know, how I move through space and how I do all these things. And uh, as I started talking to people about it, I realized that 
what I thought was common was pretty uncommon. And uh, I was even more amazed that people that weren't professional athletes wanted to know this stuff. So that was my first thing when CrossFit hit me up about doing the, you know, CrossFit football. I remember thinking like, do people want to know this stuff? I, I like, I kind of thought that this is just stuff for professional athletes. And CrossFit was like, no, no, like normal non-professional athletes want to know these things. So uh, as I got in there and started talking about, you know, uh, quality of movement and, um, you know, the ability to display your strength dynamically and power and speed and strength and all these other key factors, um, it, like people just, you know, kind of heads exploded. And all of a sudden we had a big following and people were getting better and stronger and it allowed me to kind of work out a lot of my stuff. And then what you see today with power athlete is really the evolution from like what, it, what worked for me and then helping a lot of other people reach those similar goals. So, um, I don't know if I would call myself a fitness and entrepreneur, but, uh, what we've done really well in at power athlete is develop a methodology for education and how to teach people how to use this blueprint to understand athleticism and how to foster and develop athleticism. I think it's um, it's a lot similar to, to stuff that sometimes I feel with this calling me something like an influencer or something. You know, I don't like the word, <laughs> yeah. but eventually, naturally, that's maybe what I become. You know, like by doing what I like, by doing my uh, by, by having some passion on what I do, by working step by step, day by day. You with the crew that you've assembled that maybe 10 years ago, somebody would ask you, like, it's going to be like, no, I'm going to have a crew. I'm going to have people working alongside me in terms of, you know, strength and conditioning. Maybe sometimes it's all just so natural that we, we kind of wake up and it's like, oh, this was assembled somehow, but somebody assembled it and uh you know what what a what a great workforce it must have been because uh right now I, ch i i have to say and it's not to toot your own horn but i must say it's the it's the podcast that i listen to the most so you guys oh, wow. surpassed you guys surpassed joe rogan which is quite a bit uh, for oh. me at least which is quite <laughs> which is quite a stretch right <laughs> and tell me I, uh, yeah yeah how badass <laughs> was you. Yeah, how badass was talking to all these people? Uh, I, I want to get to Matthew Modine. No, no, no. Bruno, wait a little bit. So we're going to talk about Matthew Modine later on. So we're not going to get to Matthew Modine just yet. Um, how did you guys come up with the idea of having a podcast about strength and conditioning? Ink, ink, ink. You're listening to another episode of the Premier Podcast in strength and conditioning. Ink. Ink. So the, When was uh, this? Uh, uh, I wasn't involved at all. So Luke and um, I think Luke got hit up by two guys that followed across a football a guy named Denny Kay and uh, um, uh, Professor Booty, which is a guy named Steve Playtech. And they wanted to start a podcast and they hit up Luke. And so Luke, uh, you know, I was busy doing a bunch of stuff. I think we had a seminar to teach. And so Luke was like, yeah, 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 let's, let's do a podcast. Like we'll do a proof of concept and we'll record an episode and we'll see how it works. And So, uh, they record this episode, but nobody told me. So all of a sudden <laughs> I see like on social media that there's this power athlete podcast and I'm like, who the fuck are these guys? So <laughs> I end up firing off a cease and desist to them because they were using power athlete, which is my trademark. And yeah. they're like, Oh, freaking out. And, they, and then like Luke calls me, he's like, Hey, that was us. And I'm like, we're, we're doing a podcast now. And Luke's like, uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do this podcast. And uh, I was like, okay, well, what do you need from me? He's like, well, I just need you to be an occasional guest. Like, you don't have to do it every week. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So they did that first podcast, which I don't think we ever released. And then we did, we've done a couple others. And in the beginning, I was just supposed to be an occasional guest. And then at that point, that's why they always joke with Luke and Tex that like friend of the podcast. Friend of the podcast, yeah. Guest joke. Exactly. Yeah, so exactly. Because, because I was never supposed to be the host. I was just supposed to be an occasional contributor. But then it since has grown into, you know, something a little bit better than that. But yeah, those original, those original ones were like the audio was terrible. We were like didn't have a studio. We were in our office, trash trucks going by. We had terrible mics. We didn't know how to like record it. And it was just really shitty, but we had some amazing guests. And I look back at like the people that we had in those early days. And, um, I'm, I would love to be able to redo those podcasts with them. 
And uh, you you mentioned uh, Greg Glassman in CrossFit, and uh, the first time I saw you, obviously like a lot of CrossFitters, because I played around with CrossFit for quite a while. Uh, the first time I saw you was in um, Every Second Counts, uh, the documentary oh, yeah. for the 2008 CrossFit Games. Of course, yeah. a lot of people asked you about it already. So that was so even before you started CrossFit football. Uh, so before Greg Glassman uh, invited you to create that that yeah. platform. Uh, somebody invited you to try the CrossFit Games. Was it Gras Greg Glassman himself? No. Um, so I lived in Newport Beach, and I used to have to drive up to Carson, California, which is about 29 miles, which in L.A. traffic could be anywhere from 20 minutes to three hours. So uh, I would drive up there to train at this place called Athletes Performance, and I eventually got to the point where I just got burned out on driving up. So I was either going to build the gym or I was going to find a little space to lift some weights. And I was doing some Googling and I ended up finding a CrossFit gym, probably like less than a mile from me, which was CrossFit Newport Beach. So I went up there and started training. Um, and I, I had been introduced to CrossFit by a buddy of mine. So I was familiar with it. And uh, I ended up going to training at this cross at Newport Beach. And it was it was great. It was like a, a warehouse space. They had, you know, heavy weights. There was, you know, it was just kind of like a, almost like Fight Club. It was in the back of a building and it was dark. It was dusty. It was dirty. And it was the type of place that I like to train. And uh, in the middle of that, I guess the owner of the gym, who is kind of a shameless self-promoter, kind of a fucking scumbag to use some profanity, um, <laughs> You know, was reaching out to CrossFit HQ, bragging about, you know, I got this NFL player training with me. Oh, so uh, about three, two or three weeks before the CrossFit Games, they uh, they hit him up and said, hey, do you think uh, John would compete in the CrossFit Games? So he asked me, he's like, hey, do you want to compete in this CrossFit Games? I'm like, what's that? He's like, oh, a bunch of people get together and they compete for like the fittest on the planet at Aromas. And so I was like, yeah, fuck it, let's do it. And uh, <laughs> so they showed up about... A week later, filmed all that stuff, and then we went to Aromas and we competed. Um, and then I went to training camp for the New England Patriots about a week later. Oh my goodness! Oh my which, goodness! Uh, which I think contributed to the injury that I had in the last preseason game, just oh. because, like, man, like because uh, my training was really kicking ass, and then all of a sudden I kind of changed the training for like that three or four weeks leading up to it. And, and then when I got to the games, it was like all the workouts and I think it was just too much. And, uh, then I went to training camp and ended up getting hurt in that last preseason game. And that's when I came home and had surgery. Oh. And, uh, that's, and then that was my 10th year. And all of a sudden, like, uh, you know, I'm rehabbing to come back. And that was when CrossFit hit me up about doing this. And I thought, oh, okay, so I'm going to miss my 10th year. Maybe I'll go back and try out and play an 11th year, or I could do this CrossFit football thing. So, or go to law school. So I decided to do the CrossFit football and see how it went. And I remember we launched the website and I got like 17,000 hits the first day. Mm -hmm. And like 30 days later, I was traveling, teaching a seminar and we booked them, you know, international and ended up teaching just under 300 seminars over nine years. I taught about 150, 200 of them, but the guys traveled, you know, when I, as soon as I had kids, I, I wasn't able to travel as much, but man, we traveled to the ends of the globe from the Arctic circle to New Zealand and everywhere in between teaching that seminar. So, um, you were one of the people responsible or maybe the solo responsible person for actually dividing the aspects in CrossFit. I mean, from yes. uh, starting with the strength slash explosive stuff, like uh, either yeah. a sprint or plyometrics or weightlifting, and then going on to the metabolic, metabolic conditioning. So that was kind of the heart of CrossFit football. Am I right? Yeah, well, before CrossFit football, uh, there was just the wad. And so uh -huh. what I did is when they asked me how I would improve upon it, I just used standard strength or strength templates that I had used and done over the years that I knew and just dropped them in with short conditioning workouts. So uh, pre-CrossFit football, there was only one workout. I started posting to a strength workout and a conditioning workout. And um, at that point, it caught fire and virally infected just about every CrossFit on the planet, where now you can't walk into a CrossFit gym without a strength component and a conditioning opponent. Uh, component to the training so much so that uh, Greg Glassman got shit face drunk and screamed at me that I virally infected CrossFit by <laughs> by convincing by convincing everybody that they needed to be strong. And I was like, thank you. I was like, you know what? Strength is a platform at which everything's built on. Yeah. So the stronger you are, the easier things become. And it doesn't matter whether it's to bear the load or this or this. But it's like, fuck, if you if you're not strong enough to like, you know, thrust your 35 pounds, then like, you know, how do you ever get better? So 
what we did is we we taught people that like strength is a platform which all life is built let's make some really strong organisms and all this stuff gets easy and the people that did crossfit football were absolutely decimating anybody that did normal crossfit and so much so that it completely altered the trajectory of crossfit i mean all of a sudden you're like watching the crossfit games and they have sleds and the heavy things and this none of that shit existed I mean, when I went to the uh, games in Aromas, the original deadlift for the deadlift burpee was supposed to be 315. They cut it to 275 because there were people there that couldn't deadlift 315. So, I mean, they were neutering it. And now it's like, you know, shit, they got dudes pulling 500 pounds in workouts. So CrossFit football, uh, you know, whether or not anybody at CrossFit wants to give it the credit is what really pushed CrossFit into what it is today and probably uh, altered the trajectory. Who knows? It probably would have just been, you know, 20 pound med balls and, you know, 95 pound thrusters if I hadn't come along. Yeah. And everybody started with the, with the, with the, what do you call it? The, the girls, the, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. The girl workouts, the girl workouts. Yeah. And the, what do they call it? The, the benchmarks, the benchmark workouts, yeah. like the Franz and the Lindas and whatnot. But then, all of a sudden, you saw guys like I remember even Graham Holmberg and Rich Froning. They were starting to do like three or four workouts a day, which is crazy. But, uh, you know, it's like weightlifting in the morning and then a little bit of, uh, I don't know, a strength wad in the evening or something like that. They, they were starting to uh, or gymnastics in between some skill for gymnastics. So everybody was segmenting, which is kind of do you believe that this segmenting is the way to go in terms of uh, uh, performance? Yeah. Should yeah, you segment so, yeah. everything? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, I think the goal and especially what I really push with a lot of the training is I want the highest quality movement possible. So like I run into this all the time with our training programs, uh, that we put out for the masses here at power athlete, people always ask like, 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 what should my rest sets be? And my comment is like, I don't know what your rest sh sets should be. I don't know what your level of conditioning is. My goal is like, hey, if we're going to squat, let's say five sets of five, I need you to rest enough so that the movement is the most high quality movement. If you're slopping it through or that 80-20, I need you to rest longer. I need the single best. Like I'm constantly fighting for this idea of quality. And I think what happened with CrossFit is they got into this more is better kind of volume type of stuff where it's like you can make up for shitty quality by just fucking adding more on top. And the problem all that did is it led to injuries, it led to shitty movement, and all you're doing was replicating awful movement. And that became the default. So I remember when I went to the level one and they talked about the 80-20 that, you know, if it, if it looks perfect, you should go faster. And I was like, I raised my hand. I was like, man, if, as an NFL player, if I only won 80% of my plays, I wouldn't even have fucking been on the field. So how in the world can you allow people to have this 80-20 slot rule? You should be asking for high quality, perfected movement at all times. And if you take the time to develop that movement patterns early on and make people really strong, all of a sudden they can add intensity once they understand the movement. The problem is, is that you guys are progressing people improperly. So um, I had some really philosophical developments, but the problem was I was arguing with people that weren't athletes, had never trained anybody and didn't know fuck all about physiology, strength, conditioning, or any of the classic principles. They were, they were like Greg Glassman had no formal training. He never competed at a high level and he never really fucking trained anybody. You know, Dave Castro, even less like the people that were at the craw the, the top of the CrossFit leadership were frauds. And I remember sitting down and being like, so wait a minute, you guys don't even train. You guys can't even do any of this stuff. Like it, it felt disingenuous to me. So all the workouts we did on CrossFit football still to this day, I've done, we still do all the training. It allows us to, to fine tune this stuff. And I, I think it makes for a higher quality, better product. And you know, so there was just a lot of, it, it was just very disingenuous. You know, something that I've noticed in, in uh, CrossFit in general, and not all boxes, obviously, some people do a very good job, and they have been, in a way, reassembling and uh, uh, learning from a lot of the experts in every field. Uh, but sometimes they say they're eclectic and they only listen to uh, a selected few, but oh, oh well, that's, that's uh, 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 old news. But um, I saw a lot of people right now during COVID, during the quarantine, they were starting to show and to try to get more followers and likes and whatever for each box in order to get, in order to make sure they would maintain a certain level of, of clients uh, w whenever this would finish and people would come back to the boxes. And I saw a lot of people uh, throwing uh, wads out there or throwing their workouts out there or in a, in a more official way or a more public way every day online, like in Instagram and stuff like that. And I was like, 
You motherfucker. So this is what you give your athletes. You guys are putting stuff on the board that you guys would not finish yourselves. I mean, one yeah. thing that really bothers me is that, uh, yeah. you know, program for the re for uh, what, what do they say in level two? Program for the best, scale for the rest. It's like, no, 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 come on. Why? If I'm going to think like that, I'm going to always program for Matt Fraser or Rich Froning, and then I'm yeah. always going to scale. What good does that do on the long run? Do, do you believe that this is a good strategy? No, I, I think uh, um, there's a lot of disingenuous uh, deal in, in, the, in the strength world. I mean, you, you got guys that are like, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm a vegan, but yet they eat steaks, which I don't have a problem with. But just be <laughs> like, you know, don't claim one thing or the other one like, hey, uh, um, you know, I'm all natural. This is this. And then the guy takes a bunch of drugs. So I, I, I think yeah. like if you want to do it, just own it. The problem that you run into, especially with a lot of this crossfit programming, is people like – so. When I originally taught the CrossFit football seminar, we used to, I used to give people like, hey, here's an assignment, take it home, I want you to write a week of programming. And uh, I would like look at this stuff and then I'd write it up on the board and I'd be like, have you ever done this workout? How long does this take? Oh, I would never do this shit. And I was like, so you're asking people to do programming that you wouldn't do yourself? Exactly. And they were like, no. And, uh, and I was like, man, here's the, the secret sauce to CrossFit football. And the reason it's been so successful, and I think the stuff here at Power Athlete has been so successful, is we do all of this shit ahead of time. So we're a cycle ahead. We're constantly testing. We're doing things. And there's things that I've, I've programmed and written out and been like, well, that's an abortion. Like, that's a terrible idea. I should have never <laughs> have done that. And, and then you go and you make changes. Or you look and you're like, I know how people are going to compare. Like, like in, uh, this week, uh, we're doing some clusters. So we were like, hey, work up to from 70, 75, and 80%. We're going to do uh, a triple and then on the back squat, and then you're going to rest 20 seconds and do a triple. And we're going to get a total of 12 reps. So uh, we do that for three sets, and it's a really just an easy way for me to get you know some some higher quality volume. Um, Dude, I, I, like I, I smashed myself to the point where like even today, like my legs are super sore and I don't think I was able and I wasn't able to hit 80%. I think the highest I got was like 77, 78%. So I kind of shot it and I even got on there and I was like, hey, I didn't even get 80. Like, and there were a bunch of people on there that were like, hey, I couldn't handle 80% at that. And I'm like, okay, well, at least we know where our starting point is and where we get to progress it too. So I, I think without doing the training and having a, um, a lot of focus on, on how to make people better and having huge data points and a lot of different, um, you know, athletes doing different training programs and seeing what's working and what's not, I think you just end up living in this echo chamber and just copying what you see other people do. Because um, a lot of them base their programming on creativity, right? So it's like, oh, we got to be, be creative and every day do something a little different than before so that people don't fall into that whole m monostructured routine. But uh, truth is, you got to respect the basics. We got to do a lot of the basics. Sometimes it's boring because you're going to do the same thing, but uh, it's all about the, the intensity. But it, it bothers yeah. me that people base all their programming on the creativity. And sometimes they go like a week or two weeks without doing something like, uh, I don't know, uh, horizontal rowing, for example, horizontal yeah. rows. Like they do a lot of pull-ups because they've mastered the pull-ups right now and they do a lot of kipping pull-ups and whatever, whatever, even if it were strict and not kipping pull-ups. But then it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Let's do a barbell row. And like three weeks from now, they're going to do another uh, set of uh, – couple sets of barbell rows. And uh, they leave a lot of stuff in, the, in, the, um, in, in between. Well, did you know before CrossFit football, there was not a horizontal row programmed in a CrossFit workout? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I used to program so like the way you train. Well, the way you train your back and the way you train your chest is you vertical press, vertical pull, horizontal press, horizontal pull. Exactly. So, I mean, like there's, you know, like those different planes of motion, those four different planes of motion. And I remember they, they asked me, they were like, you know, do you see any holes? I'm like, dude, there's no horizontal pull. And they're like, well, how do you do it? I'm like, dude, we've been doing supine ring rows or supine bar rows. Uh, you know, like there's a million different variations and that kind of like, you know, bent over row, single one. I mean, dude, when I programmed one arm dumbbell rows and cross of football, I got hate mail from people. That's not functional. <laughs> That's and I'm body like, building. What? That's bodybuilding. Well, yeah. But uh, but if you look and, and what's, you know, and we, we did, I put a ton of bodybuilding in there because we used to lift heavy weights. We did a bunch of Olympic lifting. We did plyometrics and we did bodybuilding because that's 
what bodybuilders have figured out is how to create a larger cross-section size of a muscle and make bigger athletes. And uh, if you look at like all the Chinese weightlifters and a lot of these guys, man, they do their Olympic weightlifting and then they do a bunch of bodybuilding accessory work. Like that's how athletes have trained forever. And then all of a sudden CrossFit gets in there and they figured that they're going to change the paradigm because, um, you know, their fucking drunk leader decided that he didn't like all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. a bad deal. Uh, your interview with uh, uh, Fred Hatfield was legendary, and I loved what he said. He said something oh, yeah. like, I, "I even put it here in my in my in my notes, which was, you got to sneak up on the weight." I love this. I love this sentence. Like, uh, programming for strength is you sneak up on the weight. You kind of sneak up on the weight every time you go for that lift for the squat, the the, the I don't know the deadlift, the, the the bench press. You kind of sneak up on the weight until you get to where you want to go. So basically, sure. to um, to uh, top this conversation with with uh, in terms of CrossFit, and because I realized that. I mean, even though we're kind of bashing a little bit on CrossFit, we're kind of criticizing because we, we because we can obviously, and uh, um, we would never disregard that it actually was a useful platform and uh, it oh, yeah. really brought a lot of good stuff to the menu. Just so that uh, well, it, the listeners don't I mean, think, think that we're about... we're, we're uh, 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 people who don't recognize where we came from in a way, especially me. Well. Yeah. Um... I don't bash CrossFit uh, at, or what I really was kind of pissed off with, at least for me personally, was the leadership and the way that they were couching these things. CrossFit has done more to put barbells in people's hands than anything on this planet since like Arthur Murray. So or, uh, um, you know, I mean, dude, uh, like the rise of the micro gym, people having garage gyms from like, you know, equipment from Rogue and Sornex and all the other stuff. I mean, it, it, it put barbells in people's hands that would have never found barbells. So for that, I'm forever grateful. Uh, what's kind of always a little upsetting is that if the company had been owned and not run by absolute crazy people, that thing would have been a fitness juggernaut that would have altered the trajectory of this world. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it would have, it was on fire. Like if they had just had some standard strength conditioning principles kind of weaved in some best practices with business and not an, and, and not a, um, you know, a C-suite and an ownership that was so morally and ethically and, and, uh, educationally bankrupt, this thing would have fucking gone to the moon. And I think finally now they got Glassman out and this Eric Rosa, uh, Rosa guy seems pretty legit, man. And I really appreciate kind of how thoughtful he is, especially in the business systems. But there was a time where if CrossFit had just not had their leadership and their C-suite and actually had people that were business people that understood how to kind of weave this thing, could have fucking taken this thing to, you know, it could have been the Amazon of fitness in terms of like, you know, you know, thousands of affiliates around the globe supporting them instead of like kicking you in the balls at every point. And uh, that is, I, I think, part of the like the trepidation or a little bit of, uh, you know, like friction that you feel is because it was such a missed opportunity by people that just couldn't get out of their own fucking way because of their own just, uh, you know, inferiority, lack of, you know, fear of success or whatever you want to call it. So um, but in terms of a methodology, if they could have couched a little bit different and been more inclusive, man, they could have owned the space. They could have absolutely owned the space. And I think that's a missed opportunity because their effect on health and wellness could have been generational in terms of the, like, uh, how far reaching it was. That, that is so true. And uh, coming from the martial arts, uh, which, which was the, the martial art that you started practicing? Was it karate? Uh, Shotokan. Shotokan. Oh, Shotokan. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I, uh, the guy I trained with was an um, old Japanese dude, uh, and you know, like the like the pictures on the wall and the whole deal. So yeah, we started in Shotokan, and then I got a little bored of the kicking part and wanted to get into more boxing. So there was a, a, a kickboxing place that I would go to that just let me box, and then I got into uh, when I got into that I did that for a while. And then I got, I, I met this really cool dude, a guy named Nono Labonsier, whose son's actually a UFC fighter. And, uh, Nono taught me Hapkido and jujitsu and we did boxing. And, um, that was really, I think some of the, the best foundational training I've ever done. Yeah. That's, that's what I was getting at because, uh, coming from the martial arts, um, I, I believe that, uh, it's, it's, it's very much different from you. You would never in the martial arts do like a year or not, not even a year, like three months of classes and believe that you're the shit. 
And I've seen a lot of CrossFit people get to that point when they haven't even done any type of sport before that. Just because they lost a little bit of weight or they got a little bit ripped or they could do, I don't know, a 200-pound snatch, that all of a sudden they're the shit. So would you say that uh, the concept of fitness by Greg Lassman, would you believe that it's not accurate, like the uh, work across broad time and modal domains? Um, I think that, I, I think there's some... I think there's some real genius in uh, in his original thoughts. Um, the problem is is how you get there. Like is is kind of different. Uh, I think the the definition of CrossFit is extremely self serving. The ability to you know increase work capacity over broad time modal domains, uh, functional movements performed at high intensity. You know what does intensity mean? The way I understand intensity is per percentage of one RM. So like if, if you squat 500 pounds, 80% is your intensity for the day. So the way that they look at it is intensity is kind of an emotional response. You know, how hard did you work? Did you go, you know, increase work capacity? Are you going harder each day? And the problem is, is that there's, um, you know, there should be some inherent periodization in there where like not every day you fucking burn it down. So in the NFL, you, you know, there would be, uh, you know, like a Wednesday would be a hard training day. Thursday would be a little easier. Friday would be a little easier. Take off Saturday, and then you go max intensity on Sunday. So there had to be a little bit of ebb and flow. The problem is you have people that are just setting themselves on fire each day with the workout, trying to you know chase this idea of fitness. And I think the problem is is when you get too far over, all of a sudden you become unhealthy, and it becomes you know some bigger issues. So I think there was some original genius in it. But I think if he had just put the structure in earlier and been like, here's the deal. Um, and actually the way CrossFit was first explained. And when I read the original information, it actually made sense like, uh, master movement, right? So learn to lift weights, you know, be proficient in Olympic weightlifting, you know, train the gymnastics movements, you know, do some conditioning. And there was this whole thing on skill development. Like, um, if you took it like a little bit more like uh, gymnastics is a great example, right? You have to be able to complete certain movements to be able to progress. Like, Hey, like, and I, I watch my daughters at gymnastics. If they master one move, then they get to the next move and it kind of unlocks as they go. And um, I think what happens with CrossFit, it's like going into, you know, gymnastics today and the person day one's like, what are we doing? Oh, we're working on the high bar. Really? Okay. Or, Hey, we're, uh, we're on the tumbling track and we got to do, you know, three consecutive backflips. So I, I think what happens is they just throw people in and a lot of times they're not building the foundation that they needed earlier on. And the smart gyms have, they've taught people like, Hey, we're taking a kind of a cross of football approach. We're going to do some kind of, you know, short kind of mixed modal conditioning, but we're going to stack it with a lot of solid strength work. And we're going to make sure that our people are strong and stable can do, you know, strict pull-ups. Like I got a, for example, I got a video the other day from a lady who um, hit me on Instagram. It's like, hey, I'm having this terrible up breaking in my upper back when I'm coming out of the hole in the squat. And she sent me the video. Sure enough, as she came up, you can see her back start to break. She's like, uh, you know, how do I fix this? My first question is, how many pull-ups do you have? Zero pull-ups. Okay. Uh, your back will break until you get strict pull-ups. Everybody that I've seen this upper back breaks, we end up doing a bunch of uh, H pulls or a, a ver vertical pulls, sorry. And as they get vertical pulls, all of a sudden now their upper back doesn't break. So the reason we use the pull-up is to create a nice, strong, stable foundation for you to place a bar. So um, she's like, what should I do? And I'm like, you can continue to squat and run into this, or you can put time into the accessory work to make sure that your upper back is strong. So um, I, I think teaching people... Uh, at the level one, if, if this, then that, like here are the faults, this is what you're going to encounter. This is the best practices. This is how, how you should lay out. Like when the people come train with you, these are the benchmarks that they need to hit before they can progress. Like I need 10 strict pull-ups before you learn to kip. I need you to be able to, you know, deadlift and do all these other movements before I progress you into something else. And I think if they had put those different steps and locks in kind of similar in gymnastics, very similar in martial arts, I think they would have done a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing which kind of blows me away is when I, uh, when I started in, in martial arts, this was probably like 1982, I think we had like four belts. So there was a white belt. I want to say there was like a green, an orange belt, a green belt, a brown belt, and then it was black. So like, and I remember I was like a white belt for like almost two years. And then I finally got my first belt and I remember like, like the process for belts were like, you know, now I, I like when I, you know, click on Instagram and I see people doing jujitsu or martial arts, there's like 15 different colors of belts. There's stripes on the belts. They got tape on the belts. I mean, <laughs> yeah. so they've really put all these like, kind of like, uh, this is how far you are a lot more incremental. 
I mean, I, I remember literally I had a white belt for like two years. And then finally they were like, hey, you're going to test on this Saturday for another belt. And I was like, OK. And we showed up and we had to do like I think we had like three katas we had to do. And then we had to do some like some basic like kind of sparring type stuff. And then I got my next belt. And then it was like, oh, cool. When do I get another belt? And they're like, when you're ready. And, I, and then I think I trained there for like another year. And then they were like, hey, you're ready for a next belt. So like, like simpler it, times. Like this whole. Well, but um, so but good I time. went, um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. Like I, I took my kids, uh, like I was looking for some Hapkido around here and there was a couple of Korean martial arts. And so I, I went in and uh, just said, hey, can I come in and watch? I got some kids that I want to get into martial arts. I took martial arts. I just want to come watch how you run this stuff. And we went into this one place and like for their kids classes, like all their black belts were like eight, nine and 10 years old. Wow. Oh, oh, and uh, that, so I that, asked the lady, I'm that like, speaks volumes. I, I, well, like, I, I was like, how, uh, how are these eight year olds? Well, they've been here for, they've been training four years. They earned their black belts. And I was like, I was like, dude, there's no way the compulsory and the things that we were required to do in terms of like, so uh, the old school, like our floor at the, when I did uh, Shotokan, it was hardwood and you had to kneel on the hardwood to the point where like, you know, the shin hop that we teach in, you know, that we use in one of our plyometric movements was how you were, had to get up off the ground was basically do a shin hop. And like, you know, you go in, everything's padded and I'm like watching the, the kids and they were like, Hey, like what time's the kids class? And so a couple of kids kind of trickle in, a few come in late, all of a sudden there's like four black belts. There's like an eight, a 10 and 11 year old, uh, black belts. And I'm like, I asked the lady, I'm like, how, what's the rate? Well, they started training at four and they were black belt by eight. And I was like, we're fucking out of here. So we left the lady called me and she was like, what'd you think? I'm like, um, one, you had four kids, not to say that a kid can't be a black belt, but I'm like, that's uh, like, that's not what I'm looking for. I mean, I'm not looking for people that just pay the money and get their belts. And then the other problem too, was that the adult black belts were severely out of shape. Like they were all really heavy and out of shape. And I was like, I was like, dude, the old man that trained that, that I learned from that dude was like beef jerky. That dude was a, like in phenomenal shape in his sixties and seventies. I mean, the dude was a badass. He's like, take his gi off. And the dude was like, you know, in great shape. Like he was strong as shit. His, his hands were like iron. I remember him like, you know, walking around and, um, you know, the, uh, the bamboo boken that has all the strings. Yeah, yeah He yeah. would walk around and like, when you were in your different like punches, he would like, watch out, like hit you with this thing. Nice. And I remember I went and I, home and I told my mom, I'm like, he hits us with sticks. And my mom's like, well, yeah, you've seen martial arts. That's how it works. They're supposed to hit you with sticks. And I was like, I can't imagine now if you did that, what, how different it would be. Oh, woof. Oh, they would take them out of school. I mean, the parents would, would be crazy. Uh, yeah, that's. I, I've been uh, having the, the honor of interviewing some of the guys that we grew up watching the movies. Uh, like, uh, I remember you talking about a lot of the movies that I watched, like Jim Cotta and uh, oh, uh, yeah. Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon. And uh, guys dude, like... I, 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 dude, I like... Uh, like the fact that in the back, like right behind you, you have uh, Enter the Dragon. Exactly. Uh, which is one of my favorite movies. I mean, Enter the Dragon, Return of the Dragon. Dude, Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon is still to this day one of my favorite movies. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I got to interview Ty Mock, which is the the the, the yeah. main actor. So it was really great. And uh, these guys, they're in their 60s and they are so freaking ripped. They look better than me and they've been doing it their whole lives he was talking about how he's now going into jujitsu for like no not not now but um, maybe the last 10 years he devoted himself more to jujitsu i interviewed richard norton who is in his 70s and looks fantastic and is still growing and, and learning a lot from from their from these these disciplines and it's like wow it's it's such a huge difference in, in terms of, of the mindset and these guys live it. The, they are the real deal. It's, it's really, it's really, it's really good to connect with people like that because the role models are starting to get really, really skewed. And a lot of these people, even guys like, I'm not going to mention names, but guys like great guys from powerlifting who have great genetics and stuff and who are having a huge following on Instagram that right now are only showing like you know, showing stupid stuff like it's like their girlfriends showing their butts and stuff like that. And I'm watching that and I'm like, oh, no, don't succumb to this bullshit. Otherwise, young people are always going to have these skewed idols, you know, stuff like they're, they're not going to be they're not going to know they're not going to know the difference between discipline, ethics and people who actually do their stuff, you know, years, years on end uh, uh, other than people who just, you know, are roided up their asses and just lift 
huge amounts of weight, but they all, you know, it's like, it's like they succumb to the, to the market of only wanting the challenges, you know, the 30 day challenge, the 60 day challenge well, and stuff like that. I, I think uh, it's such... there's, there's no athleticism in lifting weights. I mean, I, I, I lift weights every day. Uh, you know, we run, we train, we do a whole bunch of stuff, but at the end of the day, like moving a, a weight from point A to point B, like doesn't take athleticism. Some really unathletic people do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can be in phenomenal shape and look the part, but like the ability to be able to move through space and to have people look and be like, holy shit. Like I was watching some of your videos. I mean, there's just some of the aerials you were doing were incredible. Oh, like, thanks. dude, this guy, this guy's athletic. He can move through <laughs> space. He, you know, strong, like, you know, watching you actually explode and get, you know, some vertical displacement, like that stuff to me is impressive. Uh, oh, watching people so much, lift, so, like, so like just watching s some guy squat big weight. Like I'm like, ah, uh, like I, I, to me, um, like it's a great display of strength, but like what I want to see is I want to be impressed by people's athleticism. I want to see, uh, people move really well. I, I, I just am, am obsessed with the idea of like, it, so years ago, um, somebody asked me, like we were at a seminar and people were like, well, how do you know what good movement is? And I was like, how do you not know what good movement is? Everybody can see it. You have this inherent coach's eye, like just for like the same deal. Like if we were sitting at a restaurant, we're sitting at a cafe and, you know, in Portugal and all of a sudden, uh, you know, from a distance, I can hear a front engine V12 Ferrari come up. Right. And all of a sudden that Ferrari pulls up and I'm not a Ferrari fan. I'm more of a Porsche fan, hmm. but I appreciate not only the sound that Ferrari takes the time to, to tune their engines, but the, uh, but like the lines and the color and the attention to detail, there isn't a single person, not even if they're a car person that sees that Ferrari pull up and hears it and sees it that doesn't think, Oh shit, that's a beautiful car. Just like, uh, if all of a sudden a, a beautiful girl walks down the street, every person whether or not they, you know, cat call whistle or just kind of go on their way thinks like, wow, that's a really pretty girl. I was, you know, like smoke show. So like, that's the same thing with, with movement. We have this inherent coach's eye where we know symmetry and beauty and what looks good. Um, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, you see people lift weights and you see people do things and like instantly you get this kind of coach's eye where you're like, man, that kind of, that's aesthetically pleasing. I like how they did that. That looks good. And, uh, that was a pretty interesting point within our seminar being like, when you compete, watch people lift weights, you know, whether or not it's good or bad, right. Based off of like, if you want to throw up in your mouth because it looks like they broke their spine on something, that's a problem. You have to stop them. And then your goal as a coach is to get them and use, you know, cues, accessory work, whatever it looks like, or, you know, time, whatever, you know, wh whatever levers I have to pull to make their movement from point A to point B the best looking and aesthetically pleasing like that, that, like that should be the goal of every coach. And you know, when, um, when I played football, the goal was to be able to move through space and make it look seamless and effortless. Like I can, you know, the ball is snapped. I move through space. I punch, everything looks perfectly timed and nothing looks awkward. Everything looks very deliberate and perfect. And like, that is what everybody should be striving for. The problem is, is that if you're just moving a barbell from point A to point B, what does that really teach me about athleticism? It doesn't. It's just a foundational movement to make me strong that allows me to go do other things. The problem is a lot of these guys, they don't fucking do anything else. Yeah. And, and your uh, position in the, the NFL, uh, you're offensive lineman, right? Yes, correct. Uh, it's, 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 it's very specialty based. Am I correct? Yeah, it's, uh, it's like having 70 heavyweight fist fights. <laughs> the last five to seven seconds, oh right? Goodness. Like, so, so, so imagine strapping on armor, eight pound helmet, you know, you're, you know, lining up a dude who's about 18 inches to 24 inches away from you. The ball is snapped and you basically are in the most violent fight of your life for about five to seven seconds. The whistle blows, you walk back, you rest about 45 to 50 seconds and you do that probably 70 times every Sunday. And so, uh, I was, I, I am not a huge football fan. Like I'll watch it. And, and people ask me all the time. Uh, what I really enjoyed was the violent nature of the game. I liked the training aspect. I liked the training and the rud. Like what I wanted to do is I wanted to sharpen my blade. We use a little bit of sword, little martial arts deal. I wanted to sharpen my blade through the training, through the running, through, you know, the crucible, whatever it looked like, temper the blade, whatever it is. I wanted to sharpen that blade so that when, I was ready to use it. I was the most lethal, sharpest blade I could be. And I love the violence. 
Wow. So I like, I, I like years ago, I, I saw a sign that a guy held up. It's like, I'm just here for the violence. That was 100% <laughs> my job. I was just there every Sunday because I enjoyed the violence. I enjoyed the nature. And uh, years ago, I was on a podcast and some guy asked me, he's like, oh, do you consider yourself a football player? And I was like, I played football, but I would consider myself a master of violence more <laughs> than I would consider myself a football player. I like the, the stress and the uh, just like the, the, like the stress and the, and, and like the compounding nature of this like stressful moment, like gave me extreme clarity. Like it was like my heart rate fell, everything felt like it was moving in slow motion. And like, it was the most peaceful of moments. And it was like the ball would snap and it was just the most violent fist fight. And like, I loved every minute of it. You had an, inv and, you had an invalu evaluation once in which they, they said something about your you had a special, I'm not going to call it skill, but maybe a special trait in you that you could see stuff in slow motion. Yeah. You said that on Barbell Struck, and I was like, wow, this is really something. I mean, did, did it happen to you something that happens maybe with auto, uh, auto, uh, auto racers? That, yeah. uh, that, Same uh, deal. Yeah, it's, it's like they start watching stuff in slow motion or it's, they, they start uh, figuring out stuff that most people would not catch. Yeah. So what happened is, is as the stress goes up, uh, for some reason, I have the ability to slow, uh, like the way that your so the way your brain works is it kind of goes up in these little waves. And what happens is, is that your, your mind takes pictures at the top of each one. And then what it does is it fills in with distortion. That's why like when people take illicit drugs, they kind of see trails. Uh -huh, yeah. It's because it's kind of messing it up. Yeah, so that our I know, brain is that I know. continuous. <laughs> so yeah, like what it, it's just like uh, like an old time movie on a reel. It's a series of frames, and then we run it fast enough, and we see it in continuous motion. So what they uh, and I went and checked out this this doctor. I was in a study about it. What they found was that certain part of the percentage of the population, a very small, can actually uh, through like stress and kind of like they call it like the mechanism. I think can voluntarily slow time by extending those out. And so for me, uh, when I would, you know, get ready and, uh, go play and, and, you know, kind of like work yourself into this kind of like really like kind of altered state to be able to go do this job, everything happened, everything got really quiet and everything happened in slow motion. So as I would get in my stance, all of a sudden things would get like eerily quiet and all of a sudden everybody started moving in slow motion, the ball would snap and then I would move and I could see people's hands, Uh, I could see everything in slow motion. And um, that was just uh, something, whether or not it's inherent, like it's a gift or is it something that's developed? It was something that um, I had. I mean, to the point where uh, I tested it in other ways. Um, I rode a motorcycle. I was on my buddy, had a twin turbo Hayabusa that I rode. And uh, without a helmet, I rode 200 miles an hour on that bike. Oh. So I laid down on the tank underneath the windscreen and literally started hitting it and hit 200. And it, as I, the faster I was going, the slower things were happening. Um, you know, same with driving a car fast, all of a sudden time slows and I see everything. So it's almost like the more stress goes up, like the more stressful the situation, uh, the slower things happen and the greater the focus. Because it's all very explosive. I mean, it's a play is like three seconds, three to five seconds. What's, yeah. the, what's the average yeah, of, of a play in American football? Uh, five to seven seconds. Oh, geez. Yeah. I played a little bit here in Portugal, but my, I, I don't know much. I played at, as, a, as a linebacker. So you look at me, it's like, you a linebacker? <laughs> <laughs> you were playing oh, yeah, at what, well, 300 I'm, pounds? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I was somewhere between 303, 306, 308. So I was always between 300 and 310. Yeah, you got nothing on my 198, so. Uh. <laughs> well, dude, dude, you're, dude, you're fast and agile, man. That, uh, that Running away. For, for, <laughs> yeah, no, dude. Yeah. I, I, dude, I played with some guys who were probably that size and were so fast and so quick that, like, they just were extremely lethal in how they did their job. But I, I, I think from, like, coming back and having a fighting background and just the things that I did growing up, like, um, offensive line play is very similar to boxing. Like how you cut a guy off in the ring and kind of like move within space and, you know, never square him up, always kind of play two thirds inside out first meaningful touch, how to, you know, kind of like throw a shoulder and give like 
all the stuff that I learned boxing and how to cutting a guy off in the ring and all this, all the stuff that we worked on the focus mitts, like all of that translated so well to playing offensive line in the NFL to the point where I told guys, they were like, you know, what should I do for my training? I'm like, you need to go to a boxing gym. And I don't mean some like crunch bullshit boxing gym. I mean like an old place with like an old black trainer that you can't understand and you leather jump ropes and bags that, you know, they, they've had to replace the stuffing every year for the last 30 years and are so worked in. Like that type of stuff when you yeah. walk in and that's Rocky three. That, yeah. that sharp, yeah, like that sharp smell of sweat yeah. and like fear and desperation that when you walk in, you're like, oh shit, people get their ass speed here. Mm-hmm. Like go find a place like that. Yeah. And find like an old like like an old trainer that, you know, talks to you nothing about the history of this and that. And I'm like, find that dude. There'll be a whole bunch of like black and white picture framed all over the wall. Find that place. Yeah, with, with and that's where you want to train. Yeah, with gloves that smell like feet. You want gloves that smell yeah. like feet, other or <laughs> vinegar and vinegar mixed yeah. with feet. Otherwise, it's 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 not yeah. going to be good. What? So, how did you manage to during all those years where uh, when you played in the NFL and doing something so specific? How did you manage, or what type of workouts did you do in the gym to make sure that you had a more broad component to your uh, ath- uh, athletic uh, uh, build? So uh, the guy that I trained with in the offseason was a guy named Rafael Ruiz, who to this day is probably the world's best strength coach that nobody's heard of. Uh, Raf is a very kind of boutique, very kind of just not not an overly uh, chess beater. But like when people meet him, they kind of are like, holy shit, this guy's the real deal. Uh, our training like was pretty interesting. There was um, a ton of movement in our training. So he had a gymnastics mat. We used to do a bunch of tumbling. Uh, we do, you know, mo- moving through space like the the kind of the saginal kind of everything in a hallway that you see in CrossFit, like, like you can do almost the entire CrossFit workout standing in a door frame. So, but sport isn't played in a saginal plane. It's played in all multiple planes. So we just did a ton of change of direction. And then we played a lot of sport, man. We, uh, in the off season, we played a ton of soccer. We played, uh, you know, every sport we could think of to try to uh, increase, you know, like what you were doing. So just hand eye coordination did a bunch of fight stuff and, just for the most part, man, like a lot of, a lot of dynamic med ball and we banged heavy weights. We did a lot of pull-ups and we sprinted and ran. And, uh, then I would go do my technique work and, um, you know, go do my boxing training. And that was pretty good in terms of what I needed to do. When you say ran, what type of running do you mean? Is it, is it good to get a 300 pound line, uh, lineman and, and say, go for a jog in terms of the impact? No, we, No, I, uh, we sprinted, um, Mm -hmm. for me, I, you know, I was, uh, we ran uphill, but for the most part, we just ran fast. Um, in, you know, in hindsight, knowing what I know now about building an aerobic base, uh, I would have probably done a lot of more kind of low volume, lower heart rate conditioning. Um, at the time I was kind of like in this, in the camp of like, Hey, I'm going to lift heavy weights. I'm going to sprint as fast as I can. That's the only conditioning I need. And, um, now that I kind of understand a lot more about kind of building an aerobic base, I think I could have had a more efficient aerobic system, but like that level of like that piece didn't come to me until later because, uh, you know, the way, what I was doing within my training was reaping big dividends, but I think I could have, I could have done uh, a lot more on that aerobic side and making sure that I had a big aerobic base to build upon. Uh, we, we've since found that, you know, strength and all these other things really, really kind of build upon, uh, you know, like I said, strength is a big platform at which all is built. I think that aerobic base is a big component too. And that, that wasn't something that I really cared much about or really even gave a second thought to, um, you know, I thought anything that looked like low heart rate was kind of bullshit. So, um, that's, that was a mistake that I since have made that is very that I made that I've since rectified. That is very interesting because a lot of people don't know that, that uh, some of the people believe that only the circuit training will be enough for your aerobic base. Do you believe that's not true? No, I, I think, uh, you have to do train within different heart rates. And if you're always revving the car as hard, uh, high as you can, you're not building that kind of low endurance, kind of low level kind of aerobic, which is really good for health. I mean, it increases mitochondrial density and just helps a lot of things with body composition and how you metabolize fat. Uh, I think people that don't work on just doing some, you know, you know, 20, 30 minutes at 70% heart rate. Uh, or, you know, at least two to three days a week are leaving a lot on the table 
And I think, you know, with the CrossFit stuff of going in there and just trying to fucking fire everybody up at 180 beats a minute every single day is leaving a lot on the table. There needs to be some more kind of low level aerobic type work to try to build upon. So just like the strength work. So, you know, especially for a lot of our programs and the way I do my own training is I, you know, usually bang weights four days a week. I try to get at least four or five aerobic days and then probably hit three, you know, three conditioning and at least a sprint day. So I think if I can hit that, um, I'm usually pretty good. That's that's incredible advice. That's great advice. I, I think I think most people should should really do uh, 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 that that aerobic base. So would you say like uh, at least three times a week, two to three times a week, do some sort of yeah. uh, um, moderate cardio, whether it be yeah. I don't know elliptical, uh, uh, running, uh, yeah. a little bit of walking or power walking. What do they call it? Yeah, um, no, I mean, I, I really like uh, like walking with a heavy weighted vest for 30 minutes. Oh, okay. um, I, I, I love the assault bikes. So we use those. Um, but for the most part, anything that looks like, you know, hard work at a kind of a low level heart rate for about 30, you know, 30, 40 minutes is more than uh, anybody needs. And it's not something people have to do six, seven days a week unless you're trying to get in contests for a bodybuilding show. But uh, I think, you know, if you can supplement your training with three or four days of that, I think you're really going to be farther ahead. Helps with sleep, helps metabolizing fat, it helps with strength, I and mean, it helps with all the other stuff. Um, kind of how, uh, how I stumbled upon that is years ago, we did a program which was actually the the test program for a program that we have called Jack Street. And it was like a 22 week program that I had written out that I had, you know, talked to John Meadows and a couple people about. And um, I had this idea I wanted to do some bodybuilding stuff for, for power athlete. So we did this program. And, uh, you know, the deal was uh, Luke and Tex were supposed to gain 10% of their body weight. And then uh, Callie and I were supposed to lose 10% of our body weight. And then we were going to do a bod pod and kind of see who lost muscle, who did this. And, um, as I got into it, uh, everything's sort of going really well. The problem was, uh, I've never been a huge fan of pulling out and, and like cutting calories. So I kind of like, I, I would much rather do more work and throw in some aerobic work to try to burn some calories than eat less. So, uh, all of a sudden I kind of hit a point where like my weight kind of stalled out and I had about another, you know, I think like 10, 12, 14 pounds to lose. So I started basically every day, um, hitting like 30, 40 minutes of aerobic work, just trying to burn those extra calories because I didn't want to eat less. And all of a sudden, as I started doing all this aerobic work, uh, I was like started PRing all these lifts in the gym. So I did like, um, you know, we did like a max set of deadlift at like, I think it was like a uh, five Oh five. And I pulled for like, you know, 18 reps or something. Um, and all of a sudden, like my squats, everything got better to the point where I was like kind of scratching my head a little bit. Wow. And I'm like, man, I'm P I'm PRing all these lifts. Um, and I'm doing all this aerobic work. And then I went back and started reading all this stuff about aerobic base and, you know, mitochondrial density and, you know, fat oxidation and really just, you know, some really interesting stuff. And I realized I was like, fuck, I missed this whole chapter when I was playing the NFL. I could have added a lot more aerobic work, which probably would have helped with recovery and a lot of other factors. So that was kind of a mistake I made and I kind of regret. I wish I could go back in time and change that. But, um, you yeah, know, so now, uh, you know, some, you know, at least three to four days a week or, you know, anywhere from, you know, 25 to 40 minutes, uh, I try to hit some low level 70, 75% heart rate endurance work. Just a little bit of low level aerobic work. Oh man, thank you so much for the tip. And uh, sp speaking of running, and now in the uh, in intensity side, on the high intensity side, uh, so rarely do I see sprints being programmed, for example, in CrossFit and stuff like that. But if I want to do a generalist uh, type of work where I want to have uh, the best performances possible, and I want to be strong, I want to be uh, agile, flexible, and whatnot, like if I want to cover all segments. Where do where do I or how can I include the sprinting the sprints in this um, in my programming, for example? Uh, there, there was a pretty interesting piece of research um, that came out a couple of years ago that compared uh, lean body mass with sprinters, and they found that the leanest the or the individual that carried the lowest body fat, so carried the greatest amount of lean muscle mass to body fat ratio tended to win like the gold medal for sprinting in the 100 and the 200. So like if you looked at like lean body mass and uh, body fat, you could pretty much pick the winner. And the, all the research on the deal was um, the people that sprint are more muscular than people that don't sprint. So the, the act of sprinting, moving yourself through gravity, the eccentric load of landing, turning all that over requires a ton of lean body mass. 
And so the people that sprint more regularly carry more lean body mass and are leaner than people that don't sprint because you need all these things to be an efficient sprinter. So when people ask me about sprinting and I'm like, um, have you guys ever seen anybody that sprints that's not jacked? Because I run into people like, oh, man, those NFL dudes, these guys. No, dude, the people that run fast, whether it be uh, Olympic sprinters, NFL players, whatever it is, the people that run fast and sprint often are usually dramatically leaner. Now, obviously, uh, you know, offensive linemen that you see in the NFL have to be 300 plus pounds, you know, 350, 360 pounds. So it's tough to be that big and carry uh, and not carry body fat. But when you look at the smaller guys, the guys that sprint a lot and run every single play as fast as they can, they're pretty lean and they're always lean and they're always to carry a lot of muscle because you need a lot of muscle. So what I would say is I would probably pick distances. I'd say, you know what, I'm going to set up my distance at like my short distance at 60 meters. I'm going to, I'm going to go 60, 80, 100, 120, and maybe 150. And I'm going to look at it and say, all right, you know what, um, on my max effort day, I'm going to run, you know, let's say six sixties. Uh, then the next time I come back, I might want to do some kind of tempo sprints, which is like a 75%, um, uh, like a 75% effort kind of a deal. And then I would kind of just pick different rates and I kind of push it out and do sixties, eighties, hundreds, one twenties, one fifties. And I would kind of cycle back through those and just kind of rotate through those distances mm -hmm. and, you know, hitting somewhere between, you know, anywhere from four to six, seven, eight reps of max effort sprint. I think people don't understand what that means is you like, so when I was in Tampa, we used to train with a bunch of Olympic sprinters. And what blew my mind is those guys would run as fast as they could. And then it would probably take them anywhere from 10 to 12 minutes to recover enough to be able to go run another uh, sprint at max intensity, which was anything over 92% of their fastest time. So if they didn't run within that 92%, they rested longer. And if they still couldn't run that fast, they were done for the day. Because the only way you get faster is by running fast. So when people in CrossFit, you know, like, hey, 50 wall balls, 400 meter run, they do the wall balls and they jog the 400 meters. That's not doing anything for speed development. Yeah. The yeah. only way you get faster, it's kind of like, um, uh, the only way you get faster is by running fast. The only way you get stronger is by lifting heavy weights. Hmm. Like if running slow and lifting light weights made us faster and stronger, we would probably do those because it's easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So it's always, it's always got to be like 90% up or even close to 100% on the intensity or on, or, or on the, the, the full speed. And uh, for example, for a guy like me, I'm a martial artist, I'm a stuntman. And uh, how do I know uh, in terms of the strength, how do I know um, when my maximum strength work will be enough? And, and by enough, it's not that I would not keep working on strength, obviously. But when do I know that I would get for example, diminishing returns on how strong I am. Yeah. Dude, that's a very common thing. I mean, it happened to me my rookie year in the NFL. I had this idea that um, I wanted to be the strongest I could. And the only problem, though, is to get up to be the strongest. I think I ended up putting on like 20 pounds. So I weighed like 326 pounds. And I benched uh, 535 for reps, and I was super strong. And then I went out on the field, and I was like, I was like moving in slow motion, and I felt like a planet with like little moons orbiting me when these guys were running around. I was <laughs> you like, felt Whoa. like a planet. <laughs> I, I did. I, I literally felt like a big planet with these dudes orbiting me. And I realized I was like, well, shit, like you spent all this time. So the amount of time and effort that it took me to get as strong as I could, uh, forced me to put on body weight and size that I didn't need and took away from my speed. So I went home, I ate like, uh, for the next six weeks, I, I, I literally ate like one meal a day, ate like a, a chicken salad at night went and lifted weights and sprinted and ran and then ate my like one big ass chicken salad came back at the end of that six weeks had lost 20 pounds and was 306 and you know was sub 10 percent body fat and basically uh killed it i mean that extra 20 pounds was slowing me down and um so i, I think what happens is if the if chasing the strength numbers negatively affects your ability to execute the movements that you know that you need to do, then that's where that diminishing returns. Like, hey, like if you were to set it up and say, all right, I knew. So for me personally, it was 10 pull ups, 10 strict pull ups of 90 pounds between my waist was like a benchmark. Uh, five set. So I, I ended up having to do five by five, 405 bench, 500 pound squat in sub 10 minutes. If I could do those there was no need for me to progress any farther because I had hit the numbers that I needed to be able to kind of, uh, to be able to get back to what I knew to play. So I kind of set benchmarks. So for you, um, 
if all of a sudden you put 100 pounds in your squat and you put 100 pounds in all these lifts and you can't go and do the movements that, you can, that you've always done, like whether it was tumbling or aerials or this or jumping here, uh, that becomes a problem. Now, if you add those extra strengths and all of a sudden you're better at these movements, then I think you've hit kind of that secret sauce and you're probably heading in the right direction. So, so you're one of those people that always carry the notepad around while, you, while you're working out to, to figure out the stuff or, or not so much? Are you very mathematical with uh, your approach? Uh, I used to be. Um, I kind of train on a, on a little more, like I, I always have a program, but I kind of like what I call gambler sets, where like some days I go in the weight room and I feel real good, I'll kind of push it. If some days are not so good, I just kind of survive it a little bit. Whereas before I was a lot more, uh, a lot more fine tuned with it, where I was like, hey, you know what, like, this is what I want to do today. These are the numbers I need to hit and uh, hell or high water, I'm going to hit them. And I think like, as I've gotten a little bit older, I've become a little more intuitive. But um, I also never want to get to the point where I feel kind of like a prisoner of my own body. Like that's kind of an interesting thing. Like I see a lot of guys too, especially on Instagram, where some like super jack dudes or guys that are bodybuilders, they almost look like prisoners in their own body. Like they can't move. You see them and they're like super stiff. Like I want to still be able to be agile. I want to be able to move through space. I want to be able to do, you know, anything. Like I was joking um, yesterday, I was cooking steaks and it's been raining a lot out here in Texas. And uh, we had a, I have a piece of, of, of plywood down um, over our tree wells. And as I was walking, I hit it and I slipped. And as I like went down, I like totally busted my ass, hit my elbow, tweaked my knee, but I didn't drop the stakes. <laughs> so I was like still holding the plate and I was like, oh shit, I set him down. I got back up and I was like, ooh, I'm a little sore. And my wife was like, oh, are you okay? And I'm like, well, I didn't drop the meat. So at least then I like know my athleticism still there where I, if I can <laughs> fall and bust my ass, but I won't dump the plate of meat, I'll be okay. What do you think of those, those, uh, uh, um, modalities nowadays, nowadays, like movement culture and stuff like that and animal flows. And what do you, how do you view those? Um, <laughs> cause it's I, strange, I, right? I, I think, I, I, sometimes uh, I think they I, get uh, too many components at once, but I believe there's a structure. I, I mean, the, yeah, I, I think people moving is, is the key. Like I believe in movement and I want people to move better. I don't know if I need to like watch a Well, but uh, I mean, think about it. Like you're probably a fan of all like the seventies and eighties martial arts, Kung Fu movies oh, yeah. where these guys would master praying mantis, you know, like this, and they would yeah. master this and the beetle and they would do the crane and they had all these movements where they were mimicking. <laughs> Watch out. That guy's real crazy. Uh, like at the end of the day, uh, you know, all that different type of Kung Fu, those dudes usually got their ass beat by the one dude who was just pretty good at all the, all the basics. So I, I think that move net stuff, I think it's all pretty interesting. The idea of like, you know, moving through nature and doing that, like makes a lot of, uh, a lot of sense. Um, but I think at the end of the day, man, I think if, um, I really think that the, the basis of movement, like you should lift some weights, you should sprint, you should do some aerobic work. And I think you need something to do athletically, whether it's, uh, you know, I, I, I joke with all my friends that do jujitsu because I did jujitsu back in the day. They always like, Hey, do you want to go? And I'm like, ah, I, uh, it's kind of old man. Like there's, it's very passive. Like there's a lot of laying back and there's a lot of movement and give and take. And I think it's good. I just kind of joke. I'm like, man, am I too, am, am, am I old enough to do jujitsu now? And, uh, but I, but I think like martial arts, I think anything that allows you, whether it's going out and playing tennis or hoops or basketball or this, or anything that allows you to have fun and continue to, to use your body in an athletic way is what's important. But I think the idea of just like going to the gym and lifting weights, uh, so I, you know, and, and, you know, eating a thousand calories so that I can, you know, look good on Instagram. I think that's, that's fucking broken. Yeah. No, yeah. I must, it's funny that you mentioned jujitsu because I'm always a little bit scared that I, I'm 36, so I, I probably have a few a few good years with 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 uh, type uh, um, A fibers, but uh, um, I'm 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 always kind of sc scared. I'm always kind of kind of worried that if I step into those types of modalities in which you have to keep the tension for 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 a long time, and if if you have if you have to really work those slow uh, uh, twitch fibers, could you work to a point where you're going to lose a little bit of the fast twitch fibers? Does it, does it make any uh, sense? Yeah. I mean, uh, like the CrossFit was what we really saw where, um, 
to be able to do that level of high output for that amount of time, you're going to have a conversion of fast twitch to slow twitch fibers. I mean, you have to just be able to get that sustained movement. So I think what's pretty interesting on the uh, the jujitsu and the guys that I've rolled with that were really good jujitsu players um, were all like super low heart rate. Like they were super passive and just very relaxed in how they were doing anything. So like they were almost kind of just hey, I'm just going to lay here and I'm just going to be extremely efficient in my movement and I'm going to make, and I'm going to tire you out and let you do something stupid. I mean, I remember like rolling with the dude and like, as I had my hand on his chest being like, this dude's heart isn't even going fast. So I think that there's um, definitely like, you know, we were talking about like building a big aerobic base. I think there's an aerobic component to jujitsu that comes after you've mastered the basics. I think the beginners probably go in there and fucking get all excited, gas themselves out and want to go too hard. And the dudes that are really just pretty practical, really good and been doing it a long time, just kind of lay back, super technical with all their movements, choke you out and get on to the next one. So I think that there is um, uh, a very real uh, training response for it. I don't know if I would say, Hey, you know what I, you know, I'm going to do, you know, jujitsu for my strength work. Like there's a conditioning component. We actually have a lot of people on power athlete programs that use our strength programs and then mix it with jujitsu for their conditioning. Mm -hmm. So I think as long as you're still in the, still in the weight room, lifting heavy weights and moving them fast and using compensatory acceleration and a lot of other things within the training model, I think the jujitsu looks really good for that low level base level. Kind of, we talked about that kind of lower density, uh, training response. Oh yeah. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, last question on, on, on exercise, then I would just like to ask you a couple of questions on nutrition and then yeah. play a little game. Do we have time? Cool. Yeah, sure, for oh, sure. Cool, thank, thank you. So uh, the last question w w was going to be um, in terms of weightlifting. Do you think that weightlifting is a necessary tool for uh, athletic performance or uh, too much skill involved? You, you don't really need to do it. Uh, I do not think that you need to Olympic weight lift to be a great athlete. I think that there is a kind of a misconception in the CrossFit market that like somehow the path to, you know, righteous athleticism goes through Olympic weightlifting. And, uh, I disagree. I think uh, great athletes are very good Olympic weightlifters. I think Olympic weightlifting is a shitty way to develop athleticism. Mm -hmm. And if Olympic weightlifting was the gatekeeper for athleticism, then why do just a fraction of the NFL players and the best athletes in the world Olympic lift? I mean, almost the best athletes in the world do not do Olympic weightlifting. So, but some of the most gifted athletes I've ever seen are incredible Olympic weightlifters. So I don't know if Olympic weightlifting is, uh, you know, will take an unathletic person and make them athletic, but somebody who's athletic and moves well that gets into Olympic weightlifting is really good at it. So, um, I think what it does is it shines a light on people. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I said, athleticism is the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or novel task, which is my definition of athleticism or wow. power athletes definition of athleticism. Please repeat it. Please repeat and, it. People, um, people must oh, know okay. by heart. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or novel task. So that's how nice. uh, we've defined athleticism for a long time here at Power Athlete. And uh, Olympic weightlifting, um, if done well, is extremely, you know, is a great training response, the ability to move the weight dynamically in this. But at the end of the day, if you can take somebody who's a pretty good football player and pretty athletic and teach them to Olympic weightlift, I think it's a valuable skill. But I wouldn't say that it's a requirement for people to be great athletes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say I agree, and uh, sometimes I view stuff like snatching as as a, as a test. You know, it's like, do I have to be strong to snatch? Yes. Do I have to be flexible? Yes. Do I have to be uh, uh, powerful and explosive? Yes. Does yes. it create all of that? Well, yes, it might do, but uh, if I want to get faster, I'm gonna sprint or I'm gonna do some plyos. If I want to get stronger, I'm gonna put a barbell on my back. If I want to get, so I have to have all those tools in order to be good in snatching and then what what is left is only skill work of the actual snatch uh so sure. that, that's that's how i view it but uh, I, i really wanted your opinion on it so i guess we're kind of uh, in in connection here um in terms of uh food uh, you've been known to have i don't know if you like the label but uh, the paleo you've been known to be very much on the paleo yeah. side of dieting are you still paleo can i say this hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, um, so when I came in the NFL um, in 99, I worked with a guy named Doc, or, uh, Mauro De Pasquale. And so Dr. De Pasquale uh, wrote the original, you know, he was the original kind of father of carb cycling. And he wrote a book called The Anabolic Diet and The Metabolic Diet. And in it, it was like a five-day low-carb, you know, ketogenic approach followed by like a higher carb day. Uh, and we would kind of do these refeeds and it's really good for body composition um, and for strength. Uh, you know, there isn't a bodybuilder or, you know, a person on the planet that's in really good shape that doesn't do some form of carb calorie cycling. And uh, in there, and I remember his book when he was like, hey, this is what I want you to do for your diet. All of the, the diet was kind of real food stuff. It was like, you know, steak, uh, you know, and it was kind of paleo-esque in a lot of ways in that there was, you know, one ingredient and, um, you know, very minimally processed foods. So, uh, I had eaten that way. And I remember when I met Rob Wolf in 2009 at the CrossFit games, he started talking to me about this paleo diet. And as he was talking about it, I was like, Oh, this is like Vince Garanda's stone age diet. This is how I, and then I mentioned, I, you know, I've been, you know, Dr. De Pasquale has done my diet stuff, which at which point Rob Wolf was like, ah, you're like the first person I've ever talked to that kind of has eaten this way. And I'm like, yeah, man, like this is how I've eaten for the last, you know, 10 years of my life. And this is how we ate kind of growing up. And, um, so, uh, I would say that the majority of my meals are centered around some form of meat. Um, I eat vegetables. Uh, I eat a little bit of fruit. Um, if I'm going to eat a carb, it's usually going to be like oatmeal or rice. Um, and other than that, maybe a little bit of corn, if it's like corn tortillas or something, we might eat like Mexican food. I mean, you can't have Mexican food without at least a, uh, you know, corn tortilla, but mm -hmm. for the most part, um, I would say I probably eat, um, I don't know, not a ton of processed foods. Uh, am I a strict paleo person? Like I always thought the paleo was kind of bullshit when they were like, Oh, you can only have more than like four eggs a week. Like, um, you know, so I definitely would eat more eggs than that. Uh, I think the other thing too, which is a little bit hard is, um, and I think people haven't figured this part out yet. You need carbs to carry it. Or the only macronutrient I've seen that really affects body composition is protein but it becomes extremely difficult to put on muscle without carbohydrates. So the problem when you get into the paleo diet, it becomes a very low carb. And I think it's hard to carry a ton of lean body mass and carry a lot of muscle on a low carb diet. So we're kind of in a catch 22. If you're eating it for longevity and you don't want to put on muscle, I think a ketogenic or even a, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a, a low carb paleo diet makes a lot of sense. But, um, something that I've subscribed to for a number of years. And I did a talk for the NSCA on this is the idea of metabolic flexibility. So metabolic flexibility is defined as your a body's ability to use both carbs and fat as fuel sources and the seamless and, and effortless kind of transition between the use of like carbohydrate, like in high intensity needs, and then fat for just your autonomic for your, you know, aerobic needs. And, uh, the biggest determining factor when I really dug into this thing, because this was like a five-year process, I was kind of obsessed with this idea of metabolic flexibility as this indicator for diet, health, and training, and all these other key factors. And when we found, when we got, or when, when I got into it, all the research basically pointed to the people with the most amount of lean body mass. So the people that carry the most amount of lean body mass, the most muscle, with the lowest ratio to fat, were the most metabolically flexible people. So there was nothing in there about how they became metabolically flexible. The, pe the leanest people were the most metabolically flexible because fat is extremely oxidative and fat, fat mixes up a lot of stuff. So uh, as you go back and you're like, okay, what did we say earlier that um, it's really hard for or to be able to sprint efficiently, you have to carry a lot of lean body mass. The most metabolically flexible people are the ones that carry the most amount of lean body mass with the lowest amount of fat. So if I want to be the most metabolically flexible, I probably need to lift weights. I probably not eat like an asshole and I probably need to sprint. <laughs> right. Eat like like it, it's well, like, yeah, I mean, it's true, man. People do like, I, uh, like, I, I like people get in this idea of like, Oh, you know, I need a cheat meal. And I'm always like, man, like, uh, your whole life's been a cheat meal. <laughs> like, like it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it blows me away in so many ways, but at the end of the day, like, um, yeah, I, I would say probably 80% would be kind of of the foods classified where are, I would call within a paleo kind of scope. Uh, I'm not necessarily like a paleo zealot by any means. 
but like I like to eat, I eat 300 grams of protein a day. I usually eat about 75 grams of fat and then about a hundred grams of carbs for most days. And then like maybe like one day a week, I'll ramp the carbs up to like 300, 350. And then I go back down. So I found that I kind of do a little bit of carb cycling tends to work pretty well for me. Uh, do you do any type of uh, fasting? Uh, do you start eating at lunch or something like that? How's, how's a typical day? No. Um, so fasting is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, over about 10 years, I read all this research on fasting and really came down to just a really fancy way to caloric restrict. So, um, if Reducing like, there's really the no magic in fasting. Yeah, that's it. So it, there, there's no magic in fasting. There's no, like people get into all this fucking mysticism and magic and all this voodoo happens when you fast. No, it's, you're reducing your feed window. So if you don't eat like an asshole or if you can't control yourself, it makes total sense. Let me get a four hour window <laughs> to stuff my face. Right. And, and it's a fancy way to caloric restrict. But for me, um, I, you know, I like I'm, I'm pretty dialed in and that um, I'm not going to go and like, you know, fall off the wagon and go eat a, you know, a cheesecake or something. So like what I do is I pretty much uh, like my first meal, like we train at seven. So my first meal is at six. I get done. I probably eat my next meal at 10 and then I'll, I'll eat probably here at one thirty, and then, uh, probably maybe four o'clock and then, you know, or I'll, I'll no, maybe dinner at five and then maybe something before bed. So, uh, I try to be pretty consistent with my calories. Um, and if I'm going to fast it probably maybe on a Sunday, I probably will just drink some coffee. And if I'm gonna, and mainly because I know how many calories I want to eat and I'll just eat them all at dinner. What what what, uh, what meal do you have at 6 a.m. before you uh, work out? What type of meal? Uh, I, I do um, I do a, a scoop of protein, uh, like whey protein, and then I do two scoops of like um, this collagen protein, and then I do a package of and a packet of oatmeal. And I shake it up in a shaker and I do that, so it gets to be like 40, 45 grams of protein, and then you know twenty four grams of carbohydrate, which is in the oatmeal, and so uh, that's what I do before I train, and then I come back and I usually eat like ten to 10 to 12, maybe 14 ounces of meat. Um, today I had a cup of rice and I think I had, um, some cranberry juice and maybe an orange. What are your favorite? After this, I'll... What, well, sorry. What, what, what are your favorite carbs? Uh, rice? uh, uh yeah. Steam boy rice mm. is, uh, is, is, is a good one. Um, there's a pretty cool deal where if you cook the rice with a little bit of, uh, coconut oil, And then you take it out and put it in the refrigerator and let it uh, stay in the refrigerator for about 12 hours. It becomes um, uh, starch resistant rice. So you can actually eat more uh, and it actually reduces the calor or the, the calories by half. So like it's, it's a really interesting thing, man. Like if you take rice, you cook with a little coconut oil and then you put it in the refrigerator for 12 hours. Really? It changes the, mole yeah, the molecular structure of the rice. And it reduces that. the amount of carbs in it. So yeah, look look it up. It's also good for the gut uh, with um, starch resistant rice. Do a little googling on that. That one's pretty neat. So I do that one. Nice. Um, and then uh, probably just um, I eat a ton of ground meat. So uh, obviously we get like cows and you know kind of do hunting stuff. So a lot of that meat comes into ground meat. And so I end up just cooking a ton of ground up meat and just kind of mix it up. And what about dairy? Do did you uh, take any dairy? Like milk, uh, raw milk, a little milk, bit, little like bit of Greek. Uh, okay. If I could get it, um, it's pretty hard to get here in Texas, but uh, I do a little bit of Greek yogurt. Huh. I do like Greek yogurt, so I try to hit hit a little bit of that if I'm low on calories. But I try to have that at least maybe three days a week. I'm not overly – like my little boy smashes whole milk. He's four. He drinks milk all day. Um, but uh, for me, like uh, I drank a lot of milk when I was a kid. Like I'm not obsessed with dairy. Like I don't – like I'll eat a little bit of cheese. But for the most part, like uh, I just – you know, like it, it's not it, – it's just like – It's just extremely nutrient dense. Like you sit down and eat a couple pieces of cheese and you're like, man, that was a lot of calories. So, yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, you know? it's nice to know that uh, you're normal. <laughs> a lot of people, it's yeah, like, yeah, well, no, I, I mean, fast like two days in a row and stuff like that. And then no, I, 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 no, I, dude, I, I, I lift heavy weights and we do a lot of training and stuff and I, I like to eat. Um, but I just don't eat like an asshole, man. Like it just, <laughs> I love that. Um, That's got to be in the next t-shirt. Well, <laughs> Don't yeah, eat like it, it's it, it's yeah, and and like I, I we run into people all the time with diets, and it's like they like 
at the end of the day, uh, you know, what was it? Einstein's, uh, you know, thermodynamics deal. You know, there's no energy is lost. No energy is created. So when you look at this deal, like there's a very real problem that man, most people overeat. And like, even if they just crush, like overeat their calories, one or two meals or, or a single day, a lot of times it throws them out of caloric deficit. And, um, you know, and that's a, that's a huge problem. Cause I think just people have been sold this bag of goods that it's not your fault. The reason you're out of shape is, you know, the insulin paradox or this or bad genetics or here. No, um, I've seen people with poor genetics get in shape and I've seen people that, uh, you know, have no business looking the way they do look the way they do, you know, it comes down to, you know, am I in a caloric restriction? Am I lifting heavy weights? Am I doing enough aerobic work? Am I getting enough sleep? And am I being consistent? And if you can match those three, you usually hit your goals pretty well. And it's so easy to get all tangled up in that feeling that, oh, but I work out every day. Yes, but maybe you sit down for the rest of the day. So it's not that huge of a caloric yep. expenditure so you don't eat like an asshole i, I love that <laughs> uh john i'm gonna yeah. let you go i would just like to do this little game that we uh, uh assembled sure. uh, uh before we before we uh we finish because uh like yourself i love the 80s movies i love the 70s movies i love the the fight movies so i was wondering which one to, uh, which would be your favorite training montage in a movie. So here's the little intro that I got ready for you. So please watch the screen. Okay. <laughs> this is so cheesy. So now <laughs> I do like the music. <laughs> I loved it. I, uh, man. Um, wait, 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 wait. wait. I, uh, I, I still haven't told you okay. the rules. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, there's okay, more. Okay, there's okay. more. So I'm going to show you. So th this was just the intro. So I'm going to show you oh, five oh, okay, different okay. movies, which I'm sure you know all of them, obviously. And you're, you're going to pick from the fifth. So from the worst or not the best to the, to the first. So it's, uh, number four, five, four, three, two, one being one, obviously the best uh training montage uh movie so it might not it might not just be the scene that we're seeing specifically but the movie in itself in terms of training sequences okay so i'm gonna show you okay and here's the mix I love this one. <laughs> I do too. You, you can see the wire. Oh I yeah, yeah. <laughs> Best part. Of course. We had to, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's the man. <laughs> Your buddy. That was great. We loved having him on. Obviously, this yeah. is mandatory to keep in this mix as well. Ivan Drago. We're so going to get fucked by YouTube for this. <laughs> <laughs> no monetizing this video whatsoever. And the last one. I love this scene, You know, I man. just Come watched, uh, we just watched Bloodsport and uh, Kickboxer with my kids. Really? Oh, that's a good way to go, yeah. Yeah, yeah we just watched these. Cash must have loved it, right? Okay, it's done. Oh, <laughs> dude, he was, yeah, he, he, he was, yeah, yeah, dude, he was, <laughs> like, that kid. Uh, How old is I he? I am so stoked, these four. I, I tell him all the time, I'm so stoked to be his dad. I am so oh, happy yeah. to, like be like his dad and take him on this journey. And I'm so like, I tell him all the time. I'm like, I just, I'm so, and I, I, I tell all my kids this, but I, I tell him, especially I'm like, I was like, do you know how excited I am to be your dad? I uh, oh, like, I so like to, 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 to take you on this journey and to have you like uh, grow up. And I'm, I'm, I, I want to see the person that you become. I want you to become the man I know you can be. And like, I'll be there like cheering you on the entire way. 
And um, oh, that that was, yes, that we, was so sweet, man! Yeah. You're giving goosebumps. Come on. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, I, I'm I'm so lucky. Like my wife is uh, my wife is like I can't speak more highly of my wife in terms of like everything about her. Like and and my kids. Like uh, having girls. Like I I got twin daughters. Uh, a oh. lot of work. I would I would trade ten boys for every one girl. I would take <laughs> ten of my son cash for every one. I if I had thirty if I had twenty one of those I would be it would be less work than what my two daughters are. But like they're it's just yeah it's uh I'm really happy that I waited till after my NFL career to to get married and have a family and see all this so I can be more involved. I can't imagine playing in the NFL, which was such a selfish endeavor, uh, and having a wife and kids. Like I just wouldn't have been. I just don't think I would have been good at it because it just takes a lot. It's really selfish. And I don't know if that's fair. So I was happy to wait, but uh, yeah, we watched those movies. Um, my top, uh, the number one or number five would be the no retreat, no surrender. Oh, why? Uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it's good, but it's not as good. Oh, All right. And then, uh, I guess what was, hmm. So we had uh, Rocky Three, Rocky Four, and then uh, Kickboxer. And what was the other one? Uh, the other one was uh, Vision Quest. Oh, okay. So I would go with, man, this is hard. I would go with Vision Quest at number four. I'm going to call Matthew. But, and the, well, and the only reason is mm-hmm. because you put in the two greatest training montages ever in Rocky Three and Rocky Four. Yeah. So then, then I'm going to have to go with uh, probably. This is so hard. Uh, Rocky three is one of my favorites. So that would be three. Two would have to be Kickboxer mm-hmm. because there's so much amazing imagery in that. Do you remember like he's doing like the thing and he looks up and there's like an eagle flying above? Oh yeah, and then he yeah, thinks yeah. like 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 that the uh, like these Thai gods are speak like there's just. Like so much, there's so much in that training. He says, like, when you're here, just listen. Listen to what? <laughs> just listen. <laughs> By the way, speaking of Van Damme, how bad was that kid actor playing Van Damme in Bloodsport? Remember that? Not uh, yet. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. You can forget about our deal. Don't question me. If you expect me to be punching bad, you can't forget about our deal. <laughs> it was like it's like a Russian guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he, he's not from Belgium. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's uh, uh dude. The uh, yeah, there's, but yeah, so that movie was pretty good. Um, and but then I would say the number one has to be Rocky. Rocky Four. Four. Yeah, like the train. Yeah, the the training montage. Rocky's is incredible. Dragos is the best. When he's like running around that like badly lit 400 meter track and like yeah. punching the heavyweight bag as he runs like that, uh, you know, he's on that weird machine that's doing this with the arms yeah. and like, you know, power cleaning. And they're like, ah, and then <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was power just, cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And, and then Rocky's in Siberia running up a hill and like <laughs> he, he's got like the carriage he's push jerking <laughs> to this day the best. So, yeah, I'll go Rocky three for number one. We'll go uh, kickboxer Rocky four or Rocky three, which is hard. Because where they were at, like that's the, that's the boxing gym you want. Mm-hmm. Like that yep, was in exactly. Venice, downtown LA. Like those are the spots, and they're running on the beach in the weird span in the weird polyester. So that would be <laughs> three, four would be Matthew Modine in Vision Quest, and the only reason that's not higher is because the other ones are so damn good. Yeah, and they don't have a lot of training sequences in in, in Vision Quest. If you think about it, it's not. I mean, you you watch him run to the sound of Journey, which is great. Uh, yeah. Only the young. Wh- which one's your favorite song in that movie? That's a tough one. Is it Madonna? Um, is it Journey? It's, it, is it Europe? No, no not Europe. Um, uh, uh, Berlin. Berlin have a have a song there. No, what is it? It's, it's called uh, No More Words. The, uh, mm. Yeah, hold on. Now I'm gonna have to pull this up because I uh, the song. Hold on. <laughs> uh, now uh, I'm gonna have to pull this up. Only the young from Journey. Uh, which one is it? Oh, uh, 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 no. people talking and they're saying that you're leaving. This, uh, for, from wait, so, John Wait. Uh, J- John John Wayne change, change. Like that song to me is yeah. yep, and the, but then the 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 other one too, which is it is probably like the hallmark of that whole movie. As soon as you hear it, is uh, "Lunatic Fringe" by Red Rider. Oh, how that's come I like the, that one? That's like the 
that's lunatic fringe. Like that's the one where he, he goes into the, at like before the, uh, his big match, when he goes into the, uh, like the other room to do his warm up. Yeah. That's the song that plays dun, 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 oh. like that, that one. So, okay. Yep. That one. Yep. Lun- Lun- so yeah, I go with lunatic fringe. Lunatic fringe. Okay. Okay. John, this was incredible. Thank you so much. I've been wanting to do this with you for a long, the longest time because I saw you the first time, maybe 2009, 2010, with that documentary, which I'm sure it's not. Sometimes you say, oh, God damn, that documentary again. I know, I know it was, it was uh, tough. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, the, But, the amount of people that uh, were home, uh, you know, for the quarantine, like the lockdown, that were watching Netflix and saw that movie and then decided to hit me on Instagram <laughs> or social media was pretty funny, man. Like, like the amount of people that were like, I was watching this whole CrossFit movie hmm. and I can't believe, you know, and I'm like, ah, you know what? I was young. I, you know, we, we didn't get paid anything. And, hmm. uh, but it was fun. It's a I, classic. You know, I it's a classic. It's a classic. Well, it's going to be yeah. a classic. I appreciate being weaved into that kind of a, uh, early CrossFit culture. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So, John, thank you so much uh, for this. And I don't know if you have any final words or tips on uh, um, on training for 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 most of our audience. Yeah. I, I'm, if if you had like one final word or one final advice, or or uh, and uh, plug in your your uh, programming yeah. and uh, your uh, your uh, website slash platform. Yeah, um, we're, we're easy to find, powerathletehq.com. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of training programs. I mean, you know, probably right now, five plus thousand people a day are checking programs around the world. So we, uh, you know, we have a program for just kind of fits about every need, you know, uh, Field Strong, which is our kind of athletic based performance program, Jack Street, which is more bodybuilding, uh, the Hammer stuff, which has really been for our first responders, door kickers, and actually a lot of hunters are doing that one, uh, Grindstone, which is uh, set up more for, you know, people that are, you know, professionals that lead a little more flexible schedule. And then um, I reskin the original CrossFit football into something that's called Johnny Wad, which is just kind of a tongue in cheek <laughs> humor. But yeah. um, if you followed or, or know about CrossFit football, it's basically, I just changed the name standard old school CrossFit football is uh, called Johnny Wad. And you can find that at johnnywad.com. Um, and then I added another pretty fun program called Johnny Bod, which is just an accessory program that uh, I put out, which is, you know, just looks like calves, abs and arms and, you know, chest and a bunch of fun stuff. So a bunch of people follow that, too. So we're pretty easy. We do a methodology where we teach people how to coach and, um, you know, the information that they need to be successful in the strength and conditioning world. So we do that and, you know, do a podcast, which is Power Athlete Radio, which, you know, is uh, has been pretty good. So. Um, I think we're coming up on our 400th episode, which we, you know, recently just had Matthew Modine from uh, Vision Quest on, exactly. which is pretty good. So, yeah, it, yeah, a lot, lot of fun stuff. Thank you so much for this. And uh, go have some lunch because I'm sure you're probably starving. It's like, what, two, two o'clock, <laughs> two p.m. there or something? Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's two, it's, it's two 15. Well, dude, thank you so much for having me and, uh, inviting me on. It's always great to connect with people. And, uh, dude, I just really always blessed for the opportunities to meet new people. Thank you so much. And say hi to Luke and text for me. I will. Thank you. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Bye.